and we are back, folks. Another edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider, Sam Webb and Tim McCormick. And talking about Michigan in the Sweet 16, taking down Tennessee. And one of us, the last time, picked Michigan to win. The other of us had Michigan going down in the second round of his bracket. Both of us, though, felt that this was a game that Michigan could win, provided they did certain things that on the defensive end of the of the floor, they executed certain principles. Uh, you saw some different guys step up offensively. Both things happened. Both things happened in this game. And Michigan won. Michigan is in the round of 16, taking on Villanova, joining me to break all of that down, to serve me my helping of Crow, is my guy. He wore the uniform for Michigan, played at a high level, became a first-round draft pick, played in the NBA for 10 years, been a basketball commentator, one of the best in the land ever since. My guy, Tim McCormick. Tim, how you doing, man? Oh, I don't know. This Sweet 16 <laughs> stuff's getting old, Sam. Five straight years, not a big deal. No, I, uh, I, I'm elated. And congratulations to Juwan. And all of the Michigan Wolverines and the fans everywhere. And, you know, the, the word I would use to describe this is improbable. And I, I want you to go back in time with me, okay? January 14th, Michigan loses at Illinois. They just lost three straight games. Three of their games were either postponed or canceled. Um, and to add to the challenge, Michigan is so young with seven of their nine rotational guys are either underclassmen or transfers. And to make matters worse, they lose Juwan Howard at the one point after Wisconsin that they just couldn't. And to me, a tailspin and collapse was inevitable, and they didn't. And, and then there was all of a sudden the first round loss in the Big Ten tournament. And then we were talking about would they get in? I think I'm not sure it doesn't look great and then they're in and and then all of a sudden you're playing Colorado State and you're down five at half um, the team came out so confident and poised and they they were they were just going to take care of business because that's what they were there for um, nine teams from the Big Ten only two are built for March success and Sam I, I see a path that Michigan can beat Villanova. I really do. And I want to dive into Nova a little bit later. Um, but right now, I think it's a great time to break down this Tennessee because it was fantastic. They they made some great adjustments. The guys played with so much passion. And I just, I couldn't be more proud. Yeah, so first of all, kudos to the team. It was a total team victory. I thought Juwan Howard coached one, and his staff coached one hell of a game. The defensive adjustments in this game were sublime. The defensive game plan, first of all, and then the adjustments in game were outstanding. Outstanding. And so starting off first, though, the tone on the offensive end of the floor was set by Hunter Dickinson. Now, mm -hmm. you know, interesting to note, the three of his first four baskets were from the perimeter, two threes and a mid-range jumper. And they started. They start them. Start with them away from the basket by design. A great deal, right? You like you said. You you want you want Hunter. If you got a high low scenario, you don't want both guys clogging the lane. You want Musa down low with Hunter feeding or Hunter, you know, in the corner maybe shooting the three. And you're working Musa early. And if Hunter's hitting his threes, oh man, then stick with it. If he's not, maybe you start emphasizing him in the post a little bit earlier, but he set the tone early, Tim, with his ability to stretch that defense, show Tennessee it was going to be a long day because he was going to be hitting his jump shot. And to, um, to, to heap more praise on Hunter, it shows how hard he's worked because last year he wouldn't have made those shots. Uh, my Mount Rushmore of Michigan big men are Phil Hubbard, Chris Weber, Juwan Howard, and Hunter, and I don't think you can even argue it. Um, he was was so darn good. And and I, I love the fact that he and Eli have combined for 87 points in two games. Those are the two guys that you would hope would step forward, and they did. 
And I'm going to say this without hesitation. You know, I want Hunter in the NBA next year. I don't want him back at Michigan. Wow. As much as I love watching him play and he's coming on, this guy has given me so much joy watching him play. If he's in the NBA next year, it's because he takes his team to a Final Four and he shows all the things that and he gets drafted. He's not leaving unless – Unless he does something special over the next several weeks. And so I, I want him to be happy. I want him to chase his dream. I talked to him before the Air Force game earlier this year. And he said, Tim, I'm, I'm going to be in the NBA next year. And so that, that was a strong statement. And especially because a lot of NBA teams don't think he's ready. That's the feedback he got. I want Hunter Dickinson in the NBA next year. Because that means that Michigan has a phenomenal finish to this season. Yeah, and they didn't have an answer for Hunter. No. Yeah, outside or inside. I mean, outside, it's like, oh, well, shoot, we got a long day if he can hit that shot. But I knew that coming out of the break, that three of his first four baskets on the outside, they're going to work Hunter in the post. That's exactly what they did. And, mm-hmm. it, I mean, it just made, it made matters worse for them that now he is really abusing their, their big men on the inside. You got Eli Brooks with his best game as a Wolverine, Tim, uh, you know, showing you, you need a go-get-it guy, a bucket getter on the outside. Now, that's not how I've ever described Eli. I don't know if you've ever described Eli that way. But in this contest, he was a bucket getter. You gave the ball to Eli Brooks, and he made things happen. Yeah, and a special thanks to X. Xavier Simpson taught him the hook. I don't know where he came up with that. But that was the most beautiful shot of his career. I think, I don't know this for sure, but Eli Brooks has to be the winningest player in Michigan basketball history. And, and he, um, he got great shots Mm -hmm. and he was so smart. And remember, Tennessee is truly an elite defensive team and Michigan has shot over 50% in both games. Um, against Tennessee, they were plus 12 from three. I didn't expect that. Uh, they made 80% of their free throws, plus six at the line. And I also like the fact versus a driving Tennessee team, Michigan only had 12 fouls the entire game. And, and, and so it was, um, it was smart. It was efficient, effective. And, and it all started because Hunter Dickinson made space for everybody else. Um, I also, we've got to show some love for Terrence Williams. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Oh, it's okay. coming. See, uh, I, that's, that's my leave me, leave guy. Me, Sam. <laughs> that's my Nintendo guy. But I want to I want to shout out the plan, because if you go back to the last episode, play it through, and I know some Tennessee fans did, and they thought, one guy thought it was ridiculous. And I was saying, hey, let him, let him shoot. If you got to pick your poison, you want him shooting, not driving. And so gear your defense toward that. You cannot win this game with Kennedy Chandler and Zagai Ziegler living in the lane. You will get beat. The game plan reflected that. And I was listening to the commentators, Tim, and they were like, you know, they hit a couple mid-range jumpers. Uh, one of the bigs hit hit a, a open pass to the corner on a roll, and they're like, wow, Michigan is, I don't know about this zone. And I'm like, man, that's what you do against this squad because you saw, Tim, when they extended, when the bigs extended, on the perimeter a little too far or anyone other than Frankie was stepping on the toes of one of those guards. It was a blow by guarantee. I said, Hey, you're going to have Devontae's going to have a tough time standing in front of these guys. Part of it was, he wasn't quite 100%. The other part, not the quickest guy. And so Zakai Ziegler and Kennedy Chandler, when they had a, when they had a guy crowding them, it was Ole to the rim. When Michigan went zone, when they blitzed the ball screen, it disrupted them. And yeah, I mean, they got some some threes. Michigan had late contests on threes, but there was some open airspace there that if they could hit threes, you got to tip your cap. They were what, two for 18, Tim? Great game plan. So first of all, we've talked all year long about Michigan's perimeter defense was a major issue. There were games they were atrocious, and typically in the games that they gave up 80-plus points, their pick and roll defense was a big part of it. And I think that that when you're trying to analyze pick and roll defense, it's really difficult 
to, to, to figure out exactly what a team is doing. There's so many in, in, intricacies. Now, I think that the big adjustment came against Colorado State, and we didn't really get into it um, prior to the Tennessee game. But but I thought that in the first half defensively, pick and roll coverage was horrendous against Colorado State. And all year long, Hunter Dickinson has been exposed 30 feet away covering guards. And 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 the halftime adjustment that helped them beat Tennessee occurred at halftime of, of Colorado State. And and it was brilliant. And and here's what I saw all year long. Hunter is not quick enough to cover 30 feet from the basket. And teams just go right at him. To add on to that, Musa and Caleb are not great at it either because they're not quite quick enough, and they're also freshmen. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I saw is was an adjustment with Hunter Dickinson. And they said, look, we're not going to have you chasing out on the perimeter as much. We're going to keep you in the paint, you own the boards, and we're going to encourage these guys to shoot mid-range jump shots. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I, I, go look at the film, Sam. It was there. They made an adjustment against Colorado State, and then they took off defensively. And and I'd be curious, when, when you talk to Phil Martelli, ask him about it. Ask him about the pick-and-roll adjustments at halftime of both games. So if you flash forward to Tennessee on Saturday, for some reason, I'm not sure why, it looked like Michigan went back to their same defense trying to take away the three-point line. And, and Tennessee, they they struggled when Michigan made that same adjustment. Um, Tennessee had 20, I'm sorry, I think it was 31 points in the second half total. And for the game, they didn't shoot very well. They only made two threes the entire game. So it, it wasn't just Hunter. It was Caleb and Musa. And the adjustment by keeping those guys more compact, closing down the lane, living with mid-range jump shots, not only held Tennessee down, but I think that Michigan's players collectively were like, this is great. This, this is really working. <laughs> and, and it helped their whole game. Michigan's offense was better in the second half of both of those games. The players liked the coverage. I think that we're going to see it the entire t- time against Villanova. Yeah, I think so. To me, one of the issues with with Colorado State is you you had some bigs that could really shoot it, and so it it put you in a quandary. It was a bit of a dilemma in that you you almost felt like you needed to extend, uh, you needed to to pressure them a, a little more because those guys were shooting. But these guys for Tennessee, they're they're their front court players weren't necessarily shooting. Now you had other guys that they could go small and you had other guys that could really shoot. And there, were, there was a time or two where both Musa and Hunter got too far outside. It was a dribble drive to the rim, right? But not just leaving it at them and, and getting back to your point. Yes, it was one of those deals where you want to invite, invite them in a little bit. If they can hit the mid range jumper, especially those bigs tip your cap and they hit it a couple of times. And that's when the, the commentator is like, hey, man, they got to get out of whatever they're doing. They got to get out of it. It's like, no, no, no. See if, they can, range. see if they can keep hitting that shot. Right. I, I I would rather that than have them completely exploit and blow up my defense with penetration. Because when those guys got downhill, it was it, it was a problem. And it, it made me say, all right, whatever, whatever adjustments you need to make. So he went back to zone. There were times they dropped in some drop coverage. There was there was times where they blitzed the ball screen. I thought that the way that they mixed it, the way that Juwan mixed it up and kept them off balance was a big factor in this game, too. So not being a one-trick pony, as I said, hey, if you came out and they had been hitting that mid-range jumper a lot or hitting that three-point shot a lot, then, okay, now you got to adjust. You got to have plan A, B, C, and D. What I was impressed by with Jawan Howard and his staff in this game was they had an excellent defensive plan. They came out. It was somewhat effective. They tweaked it some at halftime. It was even more effective after the break. That was the the, the difference in the game. I felt like playing Frankie Moore was going to be key, but the plan was going to be the biggest factor, and it certainly was. And now we get to Terrence Williams because after all that, 
you still got to have someone that comes and makes some key plays in the clutch. And Terrence Williams gave them that late in the game. I thought they should have went to him very soon after halftime. It wound up being late in the second half before they went to him. Terrence was just fantastic. And that is the hardest role is to come off the bench and never be sure. And, and against Ohio state, Caleb Houston dropped an offer. He was over 10 and, and Michigan could have easily lost that game, but Terrence Williams busted out with 17. He was ready to go. And he, he was like, okay, they need me right now. Let's take this off. And then the, the fact that Caleb was 0 for 4 against Tennessee, Terrence was, was ready again. And the two biggest buckets, Michigan down two with 508. And, and Michigan and Tennessee were trading buckets back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Not getting a bucket could really hurt a fragile team. So Terrence gets the tip in. And then one minute later, once again, everybody's scoring. Michigan misses. Terrence tips it in again. That was that was massively important. And I agree with you. There are times that, that Caleb Houston's your guy and you ride him, but there's a lot of times I think they give him a long leash and he may need to sit down and, you know, and Ter- Terrence, Terrence can be a really good starting player, a starting caliber player. And, and so I think that his contributions were, were just massively important. I, I don't sit here and pretend to know everything that goes into rotations right, or uh, how practice went. There are other factors that go into who plays. So I want to acknowledge that, right, that I'm, I'm speaking at a deficit for inf- of information. But watching him, you mentioned the Ohio State game. I was, I was like, man, you know, it, certainly when they played Indiana, I was, I was like, man, we, we haven't seen T. Will yet. I mean, you know, it was just the, the, the minutes coming off of that game, were just from the outside looking in, I was like, wow, I, I wonder – what's leading to him not building on that from a minutes perspective. Maybe it was matchup driven, right? And then in this game, certainly coming out of the half, there were two things that I I pointed at and tweeted about at halftime. I said, hey, I think they need to play Frankie more in the second half. I wound up having no choice because Devontae Jones wasn't available. But when it came to being on the ball in man-to-man situations, he was the only guy who had a chance to stand in front of those guys. So if you're going to stick with some man-to-man in the second half, which they did, have a guy fight through a screen or just stay one-on-one in isolation, it needed to be Frankie. I thought Frankie, his presence on the defensive end of the floor was, was, a, was a thing in this game. You may not notice him in the points column, but I, to me, he was present on defense, a factor on defense. And the other thing I talked about, Tim, was Terrence Williams. And I, whether it's Caleb Williams or whether it's Caleb Houston or Musa or Musa Diabate, some minutes from the three or four, it could be either one of those guys as far as I'm concerned. And maybe you're playing it by how the game is going. But I like him at the four spot. And you, you made this point. He can feed the post. He can feed the post and he can shoot the three. You don't just do that from the four spot. But I'm saying you could play him in some of those minutes or in this game, he gets some of, of Caleb's minutes. Either way, I think with the way that that dude affects winning with his intangibles, Tim, I think moving forward, you got to find a way to incorporate Terrence more in the game plan. I feel this from the outside looking in. I'm curious what you think. Caleb is is locked in to 32 to 36 minutes per game. That's a lot. And, and I remember how, you know, when we talked about John Teske, remember we – I always felt like he should play more minutes. And you said, no, if you get up close to, you know, 28, 30, that's a lot. You're going to be taxed. You're going to be worn up. Caleb, there are games that he does not deserve between 30 and 36 minutes. That's a perfect opportunity to bump up Terrence Williams minutes. I like him at the four or the three. And, and I, I think he's their best shooter. You know, I, I need to look at the numbers, but from a game to game situation, well, I take that back. Eli's your best shooter. Okay. I've got great confidence in him, but I think that Terrence Williams is somebody that needs more minutes and he's capable of making big shots. Hey, can I, can I say one other thing? I, I know how much you love talking about pick and roll defense uh-huh. and adjustments, 
Um, one other thing that I thought was really important that Juwan did, and maybe this is something he's experienced. The quickest way to wear out a big man, and I can speak from experience, is when you are fighting, you know, hard hedges and trying to contain guards. Like Hunter can run all day rim to rim. You know, he can close out. He can grab a rebound. He, he's got great conditioning. But if you make him cover little guys, big bodies like that are not used to being quick bursts. Like there's nothing quick about Hunter. And I thought that by keeping him more in the paint, it, it really helped his endurance. You saw how strong he was down the stretch. That, that was another factor I didn't want to leave out. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. And back to Terrence for, for one more minute. I, maybe it's one of those things where if – Moose is going early. You roll and you made this point. I think it was the college heading into Colorado State game. You said you wanted to see how things go. And then if if things aren't rolling, you were talking about putting Caleb at the at the four at that point, right? Maybe you do the same thing with Caleb. If things are, are rolling as much as you want to shoot to get hot, right? As much as you want them to shoot to get hot, uh, you're at the at the stage of the season where you might not be able to to shoot to get hot. I mean, you might shoot to go home if if it doesn't get hot soon enough. That's where a guy like Terrence coming in a little bit earlier in the equation might just help you win a game. Because, dude, he just – Phil Martelli said something to me earlier in the season. And he said, he said Terrence Williams affects winning. I like that. I like that. I agree. <laughs> I absolutely well, agree. And to his credit – he he's there whenever you call his number. If you if it's if it's you know halfway through the second half until his number is called, he'll be ready. But certainly feels like with what he's done. I mean, step into the free throw line late, Tim. You remember Seton Hall? He missed a couple of the free throws. You get to Ohio State game, he knocks two free throws in. You get to the end of this game, two more free throws in. Terrence Williams affects winning. So do you um do you cut back on Brandon Johns's minutes? I mean, Terrence comes in and he makes plays, and I, I don't know. I mean, it, you've got to find an opportunity to get him on the court. And for those that have have missed our commentary about him and his passing, he's played with Hunter since they were little kids on the AAU circuit. Mm -hmm. He knows how to get his big man the ball, and and that's extremely valuable. Too. Yeah, I don't know that you could tell. I mean, it's, it, Brandon's not playing many minutes to begin with, right? So I don't know that you could really – Really, the minutes are coming from from Caleb and from Musa. Uh, and I think you're playing it by ear, depending on how those guys are going. If both guys are rolling, that's a different story. I mean, at that point, then, uh, then, then you know, the 10, 12 minutes that you're talking about with, with Terrence are probably fitting. But in games where one or both of them aren't rolling, like we saw in this last game, then like you said, uh, I mean – that's where a little more Terrence Williams is probably warranted. And certainly as you head into this Villanova matchup, as heady as they are, as physical as they are, as gritty as they are, it just feels like a T-wheel type of game. Yeah. And, and as we talk about the path to beating Villanova, I've got four or five things that I think Michigan can do to beat them. And one of them, this might, might sound crazy, I would bump up Hunter Dickinson's minutes. I would. I want him out there every minute he possibly can. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a lot of TV commercials. We're spending, I'm spending more time with Charles Barkley than I'm with my wife right now. And, and so I, I think that every, every one of those timeouts is an opportunity for Hunter to rest. And, and when he comes back, he hasn't looked tired at all to me. I'd love to see him play between 35 and 38 minutes a game. And I would upload his usage rate. And, and, and I know this Jay Wright doesn't want him out there. Like he he's happy when, when Hunter goes to the bench, Hunter's in great shape. And, and I want him out there as much as possible. Yeah, if you talk about the, the defensive plan that they employed uh, last time out, it is sort of caters. Uh, it, it sort of caters to him, maybe playing some more minutes. Uh, but you, you look at this matchup, and I can't remember at what point Colin Gillespie got hurt last year, but it affected everyone's outlook for, for Villanova, right? And you see why. I mean, the, the dude is an outstanding player. That being said, 
this is a better matchup for Devontae Jones, without question. That is not me saying that Conor Gillespie uh, is not good. I said he's a. I think he's an excellent player, but his attributes, what make him a great player, his physical skill set, it, it it it's not as taxing on Devontae Jones as say Kennedy. He asking him to stay in front of Kennedy Chandler is different. Colin Gillespie is a smart, physical you know, guard that can shoot the basketball. But what I think really makes him effective is he can, when he gets in the paint, Tim, he can, he can play through contact. He can pass through contact. He can shoot through contact. He can see the floor through contact. Devontae Jones is a guy physically who can contend with that, who can stay with that in ways that I, I didn't feel as confident about with asking him to go to get against Kennedy Chandler. That's not me saying that Frankie doesn't play in this game. Uh, it, he does. This is me saying I think that Devontae Jones can factor more into this game that he would have than he would have in the last game, even had he been healthy enough to play the entire way. I think that Jay Wright is the, the best coach in college basketball. Um, and in the college game this year, Point guard is easily the weakest position. I, I don't see a lot of point guards out there that I really like. And, and if I was going to take any point guard in the country in March, Colin Gillespie might be at the top of my list. Mm -hmm. And Jay Wright has spent, what, six years with this guy teaching him how to play the point guard. And he's he's learned it really well. Um, Two-time Big East Player of the Year. He was a national champ. He's smart. He always gets his team in the offense. He thinks the game. He, he gets the hot score of the ball. He's really special. When you add Justin Moore to the conversation, I, I, I just don't see any guards that I would rather have. I mean, you can make arguments about a few, but, but I love Villanova's guards. Also, they're very physical. Um, Sam, if you want something subtle to watch in the matchup against Villanova, watch the way when Michigan cuts through the lanes, old school basketball, bad boy approach, they bump cutters hard. Like you just <laughs> don't run from A to B. You 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 know that you're going to get an elbow in your shoulder. Um, I love the fact that when they drive, they come to a two-foot jump stop. And it reminds me a lot of when I used to um, broadcast a lot of Big Ten games. Whenever you went to Wisconsin's practice, Bo Ryan would have his guys for 30 minutes doing the most basic third grade bitty basketball drills where you dribble up and come to a jump stop and then you pivot and then you reverse pivot. That's the reason why if you stop their penetration, Every other defender has to stay engaged, but they'll find somebody else because of that balance. Um, I'm very impressed with Villanova. Yeah, and again, I, I want to stress, I think Colin Gillespie is an excellent player, but styles make fights, right? Styles make fights. I mean, there's a reason why when you watch a – I mean, you, you said you're an, an old-school guy, right? There's a reason why when Marvin Hagler fought Thomas Hearns, it was like, man, he, you know, he took Thomas Hearns out as much as it pains me to say it. What was it? I think it was a third round, but Sugar Ray Leonard, it was a different story because of the speed and the, and the quickness. It wasn't a great matchup for Marvin Hagler. I feel the same way here that, I mean, Colin Gillespie can get his uh, against anyone, but if you are, if you are, Devontae Jones, I think you feel better about your your ability to stay in front of this guy than you did your ability to stay in front of those last two guys, even though he's a better player than Kennedy Chandler right now. He's a better player than the guy Ziggler right now. Those, But he's not a better matchup for Devontae defensively. That's important as he comes off of injury, right? And he, he tweeted Sunday night. He said, back healthy. Thank God. I hope that means back healthy enough and ready to go, ready to have a full week of, of practice and preparation for this game because he's going to have his hands full. Quickness or, or, or not, he's going to have his hands full on the defensive end of the floor. 
you got to be able to match their physicality. I think that's one of the things he's going to be able to do. But here's what they don't have, Tim. You talked about the things they do have. You know what they don't have? Size. Hunter, Hunter Dickinson. Yeah, they, they, they don't have size, man. Yeah. So they go 6'8 with Dixon and then a couple of 6'7 wings. And they are, I think, 11th, 10th in the Big East in shot blocking. Um, they're not a great rebounding team. And if you get two fouls on Dixon, which is always a possibility when you're trying to cover Hunter Dickinson, they get small. They don't have any depth at all at that position. That could be a huge factor. Um, Michigan needs to drive. And I, I know that Villanova does a really good job of moving their feet and cutting it off, but there's no presence blocking shots. Um, I, I also agree with you about the importance of having Devontae because they – Michigan has to get off to a fast start. Unlike Tennessee and Colorado State, I've watched Tennessee a bunch. If they get a lead, they don't give it up. They're, they're, they're tough from a field goal percentage, number one in the Big East. They're number one in threes made. They, they are the best team, get this, in the history of college basketball at free throws. Like They're, they're on pace to break the all-time record. So it, it's going to be very, very important. And I also, I was, I was really encouraged with what you said about Devontae Jones and his concussion. Um, I didn't go to med school, Sam, but, but I have had a couple of concussions and it's a really interesting injury because it can really mess with your entire metabolism. You, you get headaches, you get nausea, you can get dehydrated easy. And, and so I just, I'm, I'm really glad that he's feeling better. And I hope he can get a couple of days off because they need him at his best. They need him. They need him. And uh, to your point about uh, Michigan needs to drive. This is, you know, as, as much as I felt like Frankie was a, he was a hidden factor because of his defense in the last game. He's going to be a more visible factor in this game because he can get downhill. And he can get downhill ball screen or not. And I think a, a few buckets, a couple of games ago, you said Frankie's going to get a few buckets and, in this game, I think Frankie's going to get a few buckets in this game, Tim. And it's yeah. going to be very, very meaningful because, like you said, no shot blocker, no rim protectors uh, to, to really turn them away. Right. And uh, and how, how nice if point guard could be a real strength and let Eli just run off screens and play the two. Um, Devontae Jones didn't play in the second half, but I still think he had a major impact on the Tennessee game. First of all, just by having your, your senior leader step up and play, I think gave everybody confidence. Um, he gave Michigan 11 minutes at the point. He scored two points, which isn't great, but he had three rebounds and three assists. He blocked the shot. And, and so, you know, good job by Devontae to impact the game when he, he clearly wasn't 100%. You remember, Tim, back early before the season, we sat down and we talked about, the Big Ten and what the Big Ten hierarchy was going to be. And we we went back and forth. We thought it was going to be a Michigan-Purdue battle, right? Michigan or Purdue, who's going to be the, the Big Ten champ? Look at us now. It mm -hmm. took a, it, it was a roundabout way to get there, right? But the last two Big Ten teams standing in the NCAA tournament are Michigan and Purdue. Yeah, there, there's um, and there's a reason. And I was not savvy enough to pick up on it before the season. But but sometimes it takes players a while to learn the college game, uh, specifically Caleb and Musa. And I can't say that they're there yet. Like they still have a long way to go. They're making progress. Um, but but the other key thing is that when you look at the other support players, everybody's in a new role. And you may say, well, Eli's not. I mean, he played the two last year. He got a bunch of shots up. He's a good defense. No. He's in a different role because he is the leader of this team. That's a lot of responsibility. Last year, he was just running around playing, and he knew that a lot of the heavy lifting was fronds and livers. Um, think about Hunter. Hunter is at the top of every scouting report. That's a lot of pressure. And, and he's seen so many different defense. He's seen every post defense that a guy can play. And, and, and may have had the biggest adjustment at all because he's never played with a center clogging the lane. He's never had to worry about passing or running an offense. Coastal Carolina, here's the offense. 
here, Devontae, here's the ball. Go get me a bucket, okay? At Michigan, he's got a, an entire NBA playbook. There's 150 plays. There are 25 baseline out-of-bounds plays. There's multiple presses. I mean, the, the information overload at a program like Michigan is something he's never seen. That's why it's taken so long. That's why Michigan has an opportunity to get to an Elite Eight. Yeah. yeah that was one of the things I think we got a little spoiled. It did take Mike Smith. Uh, it, there was an adjustment period, but it wasn't as long. And I think maybe that kind of lulls you into sleep to think it, it just happens, right? It just it's going to happen as quick. And it didn't yeah. for, for Devontae. Who is Smith's surrounded trends? Mike, Mike Smith, yeah, yeah. It's not not like that as much for Devontae. Yeah, so uh, interesting to see, though, that to reflect upon that conversation that we had about the Big Ten and how it will play out because, I mean, we saw team after team Sunday was a bloodbath for the Big Ten. I mean, Illinois, Ohio State, Michigan State, and Wisconsin, Wisconsin I expected uh, with – yeah, I just didn't think that Johnny Davis was going to be quite right. And so that sort of limited my expectations for them. I know they had another injury that wound up being impactful, but uh, that was something that held me back on them. Uh, you know, I got to see, I got to see Brad Underwood get his team <laughs> to the second round. I mean, you, you look at these last two Illinois squads that he's had and not get them to the uh, second round, second weekend. To not get one of these two squads to the second weekend to me is is glaring, Tim. I I, I don't know which. And then the same thing with Fran McCaffrey. This is Big Ten champ that he wasn't able to get to this to the second round. I, I think you with those teams that those two programs had this year, you got to be scratching your head a little bit, saying, "Man, if it didn't happen now, when will it happen?" I'm not surprised by a couple of things um, with Iowa. They played as well as they could possibly play, just like Tennessee and Virginia Tech in the ACC. When you get a team that gets really hot and they just roll through a tournament, I think it's hard to, to take that and, and maintain it. There's some slippage that goes on a lot of times. Um, the, the other thing that, that I want to share, and I, I kind of wish I would have led with this, that when when – when I when I was optimistic about Michigan in the NCAA tournament, I felt that way because if you look at the last 12 games of Michigan's Big Ten season, every single one of those teams played in the NCAA. Add to that Colorado State and Tennessee. That means 14 straight games against major league competition, NCAA caliber teams. If you sat courtside at a Michigan game and they're playing Purdue and, and Juwan yells out, you know, we're going to run double drag and he, he shows the sign all of a sudden Hunter and Williams and, and, and Sasha Stefanovic, they're all yelling out the play and they're yelling out their defensive coverage. You know, we, we've got to get here. We've got to get there. You know, they're running this play. Like, if somebody knows your plays, it gets really hard. Can you imagine if Michigan was playing Wisconsin in football and, and they were going to run off tackle and Wisconsin knew it was an off tackle run? Like, like, like how, how are you going to succeed when the other team knows your plays? I think that Michigan is feeling freedom and joy that they can run their plays and the other team doesn't know what they're running. Now, with four days to prepare, Jay Wright may have his guys knowing what Michigan's running, but I think that's a big key to Michigan's success right now. Well, you just pointed out something, and I got to give my co-host on the morning show on WTKA some credit. He went back and looked at the schedules because uh, Michigan played a beast of a schedule. I mean, you think about the non-conference. They, they played both Arizona and North Carolina, both in the Sweet 16. You got San Diego State in there. I mean, it was a it was a, a, a really, really tough and challenging schedule. But when you get in Big Ten play and you consider the fact they play Illinois twice, they play Purdue twice, they played Michigan State twice, they played Iowa twice. Uh, who am I who am I leaving out? Oh, Ohio State. They played five of the top teams in Big Ten. None of the other top teams played the number uh, of top teams in, in league play twice that Michigan did. So they had an 
even more challenging conference slate when you consider they had a pause, a little bit of a pause in there too. A lot, and then of course the the suspension for Juwan. There was a lot of in season adversity on top of the really really in, intense challenging schedule that it made sense that with all that new role definition that you were talking about that it took a minute for them to sort of settle into who they are and they're just now getting to that point to the point where it's time for us Tim to say what we think is going to happen in this Villanova game since you uh were right you get a chance to close things out let me say uh to start that the crow that I just ate in this episode tasted really really good I loved it. I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. I think that Michigan, on the strength of, A, the return of Devontae Jones, which I think is important in this game, you look at Hunter Dickinson and the start to the tournament that he's off to, he's been excellent in these first two games. Really, really feel like he's on a roll that's going to be tough as for this team to stop. I just don't see Villanova stopping. Uh, him, I, I like the the other guys stepping up. Uh, I'm not counting Eli as as the other guy. I'm talking about Terrence Williams, Frankie Collins. Uh, you got to have other guys really, really step up and have some success. And I don't think it's going out, outside the box to talk about either of those two doing it because we've already seen them do it in this tournament, Tim. So it's easy to see how they might be able to do it again. I'm going with Michigan in this game. It's going to be a tight one. Because this is a veteran, smart, savvy, well-coached team. Colin Gillespie is a great player. But I like this matchup for Michigan. I like the size advantage Michigan has. I'm going with the Wolverines to advance to the Elite Eight. Welcome back, Sam. Good to have <laughs> you back. Uh, I am. Um, I think Michigan wins a single possession game. And Villanova... They, they beat people at the foul line, but Michigan is shooting exceptionally well in the tournament. There's two game keys that Michigan must improve. Number one, 15 turnovers is a loss. They've had 15 in both games. If you would have told me that they would have had 15 in any of their NCAA games, I would say there's no way they win. But kudos to them for finding a way. Also, Caleb Houston needs a big game, and I think he will. He's due. and Michigan has not shot well. Um, they, they haven't had a 40% kind of game from three. They're due for that. They're capable of that. And if they do, they'll win a single possession. Yeah. I, what does Hunter have to have in this game, Tim, in order but for him to win it? 25. You 25. said 25 the last yeah, game. Yeah, Big fella came through, didn't he? Just get just get your 25. And, and once again, let me say it. I want Hunter Dickinson in the NBA next year. I love his game. I love his approach. And, and I think he I think he knows how important it is that he dominate. He and Dixon is going to be a big time matchup. Yeah, man. Uh, I looked at I remember the Purdue game, and a lot of people are going to have problems with with Zach Eady, but Zach Eady, I uh, looked at the box score earlier this morning just to refresh it, just for a refresher. He had 21. Trevion Williams had nine they combined for 30 points from the center spot in that game it's just really really tough really tough for them tim to to deal with what i think hunter's gonna bring to the table in this game i think it's gonna be too much yeah sam as we close i've got one final comment for you i want you to uh, imagine for a second end of the game in the post game handshake line Colin Gillespie is going to get a big hug and Juwan's going to console him and say, congratulations, you're going to be okay. You played a great game. And so that that's the image I want you to keep. I hope it works out that way. You know, there was a lot to that. I mean, Michigan almost had Ken, Kennedy Chandler. I talked to his dad. They recruited the heck out of him. Really, really liked Juwan. I think at one point Michigan probably thought they were going to, they probably thought they led. So there's a relationship there that dates back to recruiting that, that I think people, I mean, I think Juwan would have done that even if it wasn't a, a guy that he knew. Uh, but in this particular instance, that there was even more to it, that that's a guy that Juwan Howard really, really connected with in the recruiting process. They, I mean, they, they, the, you know, the, his kids played uh, as far as uh, Kennedy Chandler, you know, AAU, they saw each other on the circuit a lot. 
So relationships there. But it was a great picture. And I hope, I hope it's repeated to your point, Tim, that, <laughs> you know, we can see him consoling Colin Gillespie at the end of this game. We still owe Jay Wright like a few. We owe Jay Wright one from 2018. No, no Dante DiVincenzo in the area, right? He's not going to show up at the gym, is he, Tim? He will not be there, but <laughs> they have plenty of other weapons. I'll still never forget that beatdown. I I was so wrong about it. You remember Jay Michigan Wright. was leading in that game oh, early on. It's crazy. It was yeah, crazy. and the other one we owe Jay Wright, this this one goes all the way back to, to Tommy Amaker. Tommy Amaker thought he had Scotty Reynolds. He mm-hmm. thought he had Scotty Riddles. That was going to be I thought they had Scotty Riddles, and Jay Wright came and swiped him, Tim. So, oh, Jay Wright, a couple. Hopefully, the Wolverines are able to pay him back. And, Tim, if they win, now, can I? Can we get you to come? First of all, are you going to be on the on the elliptical in this game? We got inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, so so it's a good call. Um, Ohio State, first half, I, I was just watching the game. Second half. I got on the elliptical. We played so well. And then Indiana, I, I, I was working. I was broadcasting the Davidson Fordham games. So there's nothing I could do about that one. But against Colorado State, I did the Peloton in the first half. And Michigan was struggling mightily. And I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> elliptical is the key. So I pushed through, got about an, an hour in the second half on the elliptical. We pulled it out. And so I told my wife, I said, I'm pushing through. This is March. I, I'm not going to slack up. And so Thursday night, you're going to get a full two hours on the elliptical from me, Sam. I'm ready to go. <laughs> My man, Tim McCormick. And then the other thing that I need to, get, get, need to get a commitment from you on is if Michigan advances like we think they will, we can get another episode in on Friday? Yes, but we're not even mentioning who they're going to play, Sam. We've got to stay focused on Villanova. Come on. You, you know better than that. I do. I do. That's why I didn't say any teams. All the focus is on Villanova. Hopefully, folks, we'll be seeing you a little bit later on this week. Uh, Until then, thanks for listening to another edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider.